Vanessa, bienvenue sur le podcast Conversation Awesome avec Carmackin. Mon nom est Claudia et ma mission avec ce podcast est de t'amener dans un monde d'inspiration, de découverte et d'apprentissage. À travers des épisodes solo ou avec invités, en français et en anglais, attends-toi à une panoplie de sujets et d'histoires variées en lien avec la santé, les habitudes de vie, le développement personnel et spirituel et tout ce qui peut t'aider à vivre une vie awesome, épanouie selon tes termes. I am honored and so grateful that you're here. Merci de partager le podcast en grand nombre, de t'y abonner et de laisser 5 étoiles et un review sur ta plateforme d'écoute préférée. All right, let's dive in dans la nouvelle conversation de la semaine et merci encore d'être à l'écoute. You're awesome. All right. Welcome, everyone, to this awesome conversation. We're doing it in English today because I'm sitting down virtually with my dear friend, soul sister, Greer. Greer, welcome to the show. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited for this conversation, a topic that we both uh, know uh, quite well. We can um, label ourselves as recovering perfectionist and I know that a lot of uh, the listeners and the ladies who are listening to us today feel that way as well that they always have to be perfect and they call themselves perfectionist and yeah I'm just excited to share you with my audience and get to know a bit of your story and chat about this concept personality trait and shenanigan label that we do put on ourselves sometimes or Every day, every moment of every day. <laughs> <laughs> so before we dive into this topic, I want to know more about you. So can you tell our listeners who you are? Why are we talking about this today? Maybe how we met? Because we met pretty recently, but probably lifetimes ago as well. Um, just because we clicked so well so fast and we've been chatting back and forth. So yeah, just start by telling us a bit more about yourself. So, I mean, my name is Greer. Uh, I guess we sort of connected through mutual friends, mm -hmm. um, was a writer, editor, creative mind helping our mutual friend, Sarah, write her book. Yes. Follow Sarah was Joy. on the show episode four. So at the launch of the podcast and episode a hundred to celebrate 100 episodes where she talked about the book. So mm -hmm. if anybody want to listen to that, I get that book, follow the joy. You were her sanity help. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there were so many long nights, but it was so much fun to work with her. And we very quickly became great friends. And then it took a while for you and I to officially meet, but like I had known you. I'm like, how could she not be so incredible? Like all of <laughs> my friends love her. So... Yeah, because I was traveling, right? So I, I was away for most of that time when you and Sarah wrote the book. And then when I got back, I drove to the GTA because I always love to do that to go see my soul tribe. And we, yeah, finally met in person, but it's like we knew each other already. Yeah, pretty much. I'm, I had heard so many incredible things about you. And me about you. So it was a friendship love at first sight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. So other than writing, helping people write their books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What else do you do? What's, um, what's one of your passions? I know we have a similar passion for the gym as well. Yes. I try to get to the gym when I can. I'm passionate mm -hmm. about health, about nutrition. Um, I love flowers and butterflies and going out for nature walks. Mm -hmm. I also love reading, probably unsurprisingly. I like to sing sometimes. Um, and apparently I just, I really like to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I really like to try to be perfect at all of the things. Don't we all? <laughs> uh, Something yeah. I'm really passionate about. <laughs> Are you passionate about rewiring your relationship with perfectionism or yes because mm. it took me a while to even realize that that was something I could do right you know I really did think like this was just who I am I can't change it uh I'm always gonna have to deal with having these 
incredibly unrealistically high standards for myself and not have the ability to accept anything less than absolute perfection from me. Mm. So and like, ever... this is, this is just the burden I have in this lifetime. Right. Right. Did you ever accept anything because perfection can really be reached? So when you <laughs> say that you could only accept what reached perfection, did you ever feel truly satisfied or proud or accomplished? Or was it always that not perfect enough or there's more I can do better type of mentality or reactions. Oh well, yeah. It's kind of like that catch 22 where you're constantly striving, striving for something that is unachievable. Mm. And it's really just when you get close, it's that reinforcement that, Oh, I was nearly there. And probably if I just did these 20 things differently, <laughs> and was better and you know somehow not me i could i could get there like it it almost becomes this realistic thing in your head even though logically you know that nothing is perfect and you certainly aren't um but to be honest i slowly began to realize that my perfectionism had nothing to do with like bettering myself or like healthy striving or, you know, wanting to be the best version and achieve, you know, great things. It was really about, um, like it was all results focused, either it was perfect mm. or it wasn't. And I was constantly failing because it was never perfect. Mm. Um, but that it was sort of, uh, like this, this, this shield, that I, that I was holding up in front of myself because I think if I believed that I, you know, looked perfect, um, said the perfect things, did everything perfectly, acted exactly right, then no one would ever be able to to say anything bad about me. They would never be able to get mad at me. They wouldn't be able to blame me or judge me or criticize me, and. I was so terrified of those things. Mm. Like it was but, such a fear fueled endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. When did you notice that this was present and that you were doing that for those reasons? Well, I feel like I was, you know, my level of awareness has gotten greater over time and mm -hmm. I would have moments where I would go, Oh, I'm really just afraid of what other people think of me. Right. Um, And then I would go right back asleep and just, you know, double down on my perfectionism and, and keeping that shield up super high. Yeah. And it was probably, you know, many years starting maybe in my teen years where I'm like, oh, I'm really scared of what other people think. And then, well, forget that. I'm just going to use perfectionism to control how other people see me. Mm. And recently, you know, in the last five years, it's... I've really had the language and the wording to be able to voice a lot of what my internal experience was. And that's helped me process it and keep me from falling back into it mm. and going, oh, right. So I'm afraid that other people are going to see me as I am because I believe myself to be, you know, bad or not good enough or just not worthy of loving or for people, you know, spending their time with me. And therefore, under no circumstances can anyone see the real, completely imperfect me um, because they'll realize those things and then want nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have an experience when you were a kid that you felt rejected or abandoned or judged or not loved and that maybe started that inner dialogue or realizations or thoughts that like, oh shit, like this happened because I was imperfect or because I did something wrong. The doing something wrong for me was huge. Like whenever I felt that I did something wrong, like that was probably the worst case scenario that I could feel and like internalize that I had to heal and it still, it still shows up. It still shows up. There's, oh, yeah. there's always layers. There's always layers. 
but yeah, like anything like that for you when you were younger that maybe triggered that cascade of, you know, consequences? Absolutely. Um, being at fault, it's a really horrible feeling, just feeling guilty about it. Um, and then feeling guilty and concluding, oh, I must just be a bad person. Otherwise I wouldn't feel this Mm. and having it be very pervasive, being judged, being criticized. Like I know that, you know, my perfectionism is driven by a very, very loud, very prominent inner critic. And I remember pretty early on, simply because I had been, you know, judged and criticized when I was growing up, um, I hated how it felt. And so I'm like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to do this to other people. I don't want to judge them and criticize them. So, well, I'm just going to judge and criticize myself. Like, Mm, interesting. Yeah. And then if I, if I do that to myself, I can maybe do everything that that, you know, inner critic says so I can avoid judgment and criticism from other people. And then I never have to feel those feelings again. Mm. Were you feeling those feelings when you were doing it to yourself or was it just more when other people were judging or criticizing or? I think it was different when it was, you know, my own voice, because in my head, I genuinely believed that this was helping me. Right. Funny how we can trick our brains and minds into thinking that what we're doing makes total sense. (laughs) Totally. Like beating myself into a pulp hating myself being so harshly critical to a level that you know I would never want anyone else to experience Mm. that's that voice inside my head is the reason why I'm a good person why I have friends why I have A's in school and if I didn't have that I would be lazy and good for nothing Mm. yeah like that's insanity yeah Yeah, I can relate to that. I mean, mine started mostly with skating. So I started skating when I was five, almost six, and I got really good really fast. And I was always being told, oh my God, Claudia has so much talent. She's so good. Whatever needed, maybe like a year to do, like I did it in four months and I was ready to go into private, you know, um, lessons and stuff like that. And for me, for sure, it was the judgment piece. Like if I fall on a jump, that means I'm not good anymore. Right. And if I Mm -hmm. don't get this new spin, or if I don't get first place in that competition, then I'm not worthy of this attention. I'm not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of my parents feeling proud of myself kind of thing. So for me, I feel like that's how it got really intense and present in my life. Yeah. Um, just trying to use neutral words here, <laughs> but, um, it was definitely for sure. Like you said, like a wave for myself to convince myself that it was helping me to become a better skater because if I wasn't perfectionist, well, maybe I wasn't going to work as hard. And if I don't work as hard, then I don't have the qualities of like a good athlete, like the discipline and the consistency and being organized and being focused in my workouts. So again, different than you, but kind of the same thought process that, oh, being a perfectionist is helping me become a better skater, become a better athlete, have more results, improve faster until, you know, it gets too much. And then it kind of, you kind of realize that, oh, actually, this is not helping me in X, Y, Z ways, right? Right. Because the focus is so not on like the amount of effort and your discipline. It really is just on those results. And yeah, the performance. Yeah. And, and when you do receive praise that's like, oh, you're so talented or you're so good or, you know, you did a great job, like, you achieve some sort of status, then the praise you get also isn't on your effort. It's just on the outcome. Mm -hmm. So you learn to sort of value that over all else. And it's like, crap, now I I have to live up to that. It, you know, effort, effort doesn't matter here. Yeah. It's, you know, 
Yeah. And then I started to get pissed off because I was like, I'm the first one on the ice and the last one to get out. When everybody's fooling around in off ice, I'm in my little corner in the gym working twice as hard as everybody else. And I could see other skaters becoming quote unquote better than me, uh, lending jumps that I was, I had been working on for years and I was like stuck there, but it was because of that perfectionist mindset. I also had a pretty bad attitude for a couple of years, but then now in hindsight, realizing it was just me suppressing my anger and my emotions and not being able to voice them and express them and feel them in a healthy way. Um, so I, I didn't really have a bad attitude. It was just, yeah, you know, a lack of knowledge of how to, yeah, embody those emotions. But anyway, I digress. And yeah, I just started to get really pissed off because I was like, I am working so hard and every day I'm like, you know, striving for perfection and I choke in competition. I'm still stuck on that damn double axle and everybody else is getting better than me and like blah, blah, blah. So I had to actually had to quit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to, to go and do some deep healing work and heal that part. And then I stepped back into skating like 10 years after with a completely different mindset. Like there was no perfection that I, I didn't aim for perfection at all. Like it was just totally different, but I was like 28, 29, right? Like so many things that happened, but yeah, for me, skating is really tied into my identity of being a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. I have sort of like a similar story of resentment I remember in this sort of started happening in middle school um, where my perfectionism like really took root and like went to that next level. I would be in class and I would be taking notes and I would just scribble my notes down, like whatever, just like everyone else. It didn't have to look perfect. You just needed the information wrong. <laughs> okay. I would then go home and I would rewrite these notes. So that my writing was perfect, like mm -hmm. a With typeface. With the right colors and uniform. like everything matched. Yeah, it was yeah. all systematized. <laughs> and I would be spending Same. hours rewriting these notes. And I would be exhausted. And I, then I'm like studying for tests on top of that. I'm doing all the same assignments. But like I would dread assignments because I'm like, you don't understand. Like you're not, you, you think this is an easy assignment. But the amount of time... I'm going to have to put into this in order to get it to where it needs to be is yeah. like so many hours. And I would watch my friends. Okay. Like even if the assignment was like, Hey, color in this map for geography. No. Okay. This is going to take me hours to perfectly shade in this map mm -hmm. and print every single province and capital city on here and <laughs> draw the most elaborate compass in the corner um yeah all to get the exact same mark as my friend who just like threw it together and I was so angry mm -hmm. I'm like this isn't fair like mine <laughs> is so wound triggered. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah totally yeah uh, I, unfortunately I couldn't quit school uh at the time <laughs> so it, it got a lot worse <laughs> Um, before it got better. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. For me, school was different. I hated school so much because it was so easy for me. Like I didn't have to study. I didn't have to work hard. Like I skipped grade four and grade five. My teacher was like, she can go straight to high school if she wants to. It doesn't have to do grade six. So I hated school until I got to university. Like in sec five, I mixed, which is grade uh, 12, seven, eight, nine, no, grade 11. Um, I missed 330 classes. Like it's, it's written on my bulletin. Like I missed all of my classes in the afternoon because I was going skating. Um, in Cégep, I used to like skip classes, go skating. So anyway, so I didn't really, I was so grateful that it was so easy for me because well, one skating was quote unquote my whole life, which is where I did a lot of those types of behaviors of being really perfect and putting so much time and effort and loved it. Whereas school hated it because I was so bored, but thank God, because even the little comments, like I would get like 95 and then you got a teacher or even your parents as a quote unquote joke, but that you internalize unconsciously as something else. Like, ah, oh, in French, like, pu de forcer. like you could have done better. You could have put a little effort like, ha 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 right? Because I was still getting really great marks, uh, even though I wasn't really doing much. But if I was your type of student, like for sure, I would have gotten like 100%, like 
all the time. Right. So it was, it was good for me because I hated it that I didn't have to work too hard to get like nineties and, 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 and more, but yeah, I don't know how you did it. Cause <laughs> like you said, it's just so much time and like effort and mental capacity and frustrations and stress and school. Oh, I look back and I'm like, man, I regret all that effort I put in because <laughs> like I was, if I did it to the letter, I was getting a hundred percent. I really didn't have to spend that many hours, mm. you know, guaranteeing 10 times over that I was going to get this right. Yeah. What do you think it um, taught you as a lesson though? Like all that effort and doing quote unquote more than average and Because everything serves us in the end, right? Now we look back and we laugh and we have resentment and we, you know, can pinpoint those areas of our lives where, you know, it was the old versions of us, but everything serves us in some point. So, or in some way. I think because the amount of effort I had to put in was so big that I eventually did have to give it up because it was so unsustainable, Mm. Like that, that's the silver lining that what I was doing, I just could not keep yeah. doing. And, and that's so a I great, had to figure yeah, out a way that, to cut back. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say like, that's a great lesson. Like anybody listening right now, is there something you're doing in your life right now? That's not sustainable. You know, like that's a great question to ask ourselves right now. <laughs> like, especially as you know, I coach on like health habits, you know, and nutrition and training and just like sleep and meditation, like any habits that we would like to do, or we would like to optimize to feel better in our bodies. And a lot of us will go start these crazy diet plans and these crazy gym workouts and these crazy morning routines that, you know, start at 4am. Is that sustainable in the long run? Like usually not. (laughs) So thank you for bringing that up because that's a great question to ask ourselves. Is it sustainable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I guarantee you, like, I'm honestly really impressed I was able to keep it up for as long as I could. Mm -hmm. But I had, like, no life outside of this. Like, my my social life was... (laughs) You know, it was very, very small. I often didn't do mm-hmm. things because I'm like, sorry, I got to get back and I got to like work on me. Yeah. <laughs> got to, yeah. I still have to perfect me um, and everything that I do. And it also just really got in the way of, you know, trying new things mm. because I had this mindset of, oh, I have to be perfect. And if I'm not perfect, then I'm not going to do it. And so as part of this, not only am I expending so much energy and not getting very far and being exhausted, but I also was not happy. Mm. You know, I wasn't expanding into life. I was contracting into it because I had to, you know, I only had so much bandwidth for (laughs) this one endeavor of, of trying to be perfect. And it just meant that like, I was missing out on things and I was seeing all of these other people like just try new things and they would suck at it, but then they would get better. And I was like, Mm -hmm. that doesn't compute, but I want it. It seems a lot nicer where you are than where I am inside. Yeah. Less pressure, more fun, more joy, more adventures, even, you know, exploring new areas. Yeah, I totally get it. For me too, like if I were to start, especially something related to like sports, because I was always like an athlete, always very active. So let's say I would try, I don't know, like soccer for fun, you know, with friends in high school and I wasn't good at it. Oh man, I was, I I would get so competitive and be like, there's like, there's no way I'm not good at this. Like I'm supposed quote unquote to be good because I'm an athlete and I'm not perfect. The first time I try to kick a ball, like... (laughs) How dare I? (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't have even tried. Be like, sorry, I can't be perfect at this because I've never tried it before. So I'm not doing it. Yeah, (laughs) it's crazy how it can limit us. And and it it all stems from fear, like you said, right? Like fear of judgment, fear of not being accepted, fear of not being loved. It's crazy the things that we're not even conscious of especially when we're younger because I don't know for you but for me I wasn't consciously thinking like oh I am acting this way on the eyes because I'm craving love and support from that person or this person right like it's so unconscious 
And this is where I love the quote or the saying that says like, oh, your, your programming is not your fault, but then it's your responsibility when you get older to become aware, to break the patterns, to do the work, to listen to these types of conversations, to look at yourself in the mirror, you know, to, to shift your patterns and your behaviors and try something different than what you're used to, because that pattern or that label doesn't serve you anymore. But when we're kids and teenagers, man, it's, it's not easy to be aware of that. No. And it's not like that is, that's not taught to us. So it's not in our awareness. You know, I was saying to you earlier, I'm like, I just thought I came out of the womb like this, (laughs) you know, like, (laughs) sorry, this is just who I am. I didn't realize that it was like, a way for me to try and guard against hurt and and criticism and judgment and blame because I didn't want to experience those things because they didn't feel good and how just like isolating it was because like here I am like spending again so much time and so much energy actively trying not to be seen for who I am because Mm -hmm. who I am is imperfect And therefore it's not safe to be who I am. So like all this time, unknowingly, I'm just like sacrificing my authenticity. And that was not something I was aware of at all. Mm -hmm. Again, when I was a kid, I thought this was my authentic self. (laughs) Oh yeah, for sure. I remember when I did a retreat in 2019 with uh, Ken and Brat, and we did this exercise and we had to write down all our personalities So like Claudia in traffic is maybe like, not anymore, but like angry Claudia or Claudia who's like at the club, you know, well, she's party, like dance party, Claudia, you know, dances on table and then coach Claudia. So anyway, like these roles, you know, that we have um, these, these, these parts of our personalities that show up in different situations. And then we had to either scratch or like erase all these parts of ourselves that don't really serve us anymore. Like being angry, Claudia in traffic does not serve me. I can control the traffic. I can just remain calm and at peace and accept that, oh, there's traffic today. So that part, like scratch it, doesn't serve me. Dance party, Claudia, of course she serves me. Like she has fun. She's outgoing. She loves dancing. So anyway, after I removed most of these personalities from my sheet, obviously perfectionist Claudia was on there and consistent Claudia was on there and organized and disciplined and all these great qualities that served me up until that point when I was 28. But then I looked at my sheet and I was like, who the fuck am I if I'm not all these labels and all these roles and personalities? And I cried for like half a day because I was like, who am I if I'm not perceived either by myself or by others as perfectionist Claudia? And I have goosebumps right now just remembering that moment. But yeah, like we're not born this way, (laughs) which means we can become these labels, but we can also undo and unlearn and let go of whatever is on our sheet of paper that doesn't serve us anymore. How did you start letting go of that label other than it was unsustainable and you had to stop, but (laughs) anything else that, you know, you did or you started to do to, and I know it's still a work in progress. It for sure is for me as well, but what was the first, you know, couple steps in that journey? Yeah. I mean, aside from it being wholly unsustainable and causing me not to live my life. um, Very valid reasons. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, It was that I think, I, I began to realize that there was there was a part of me that wasn't a perfectionist. That was it. Where it was like, oh, I only show up as like a perfectionist in things that I uh, really care about or value. As you said, like with school, like you were mm-hmm. like, well, I didn't like school, so I wasn't going to bother like being my perfectionist self in school if I could just like skate by. So I'm like, okay, so why is it I care so much about these things and I'm a perfectionist here, but I'm not elsewhere, which Mm. kind of led me to feel like, so I have the capacity to show up imperfectly and the world doesn't fall apart Mm -hmm. and I don't die and people don't hate me. This is really interesting. Mm. And realizing that it's, it, like I said, it's so exhausting to, to be in control and feel like you have to, you know, 
anxiously think about every single possibility and every single way people could perceive you to like preempt it right and get around any pitfall um it's so tiring and wanting I just wanted something different I was so tired I was so exhausted and one of the ways that I it this is going to sound so simple and really not that profound but you sh- just do it you show up imperfectly and you do it scared mm. and it's and, and you let go of that control and it was not easy because behind that is it's totally fear driven yeah so like when I say do it scared maybe do it petrified too (laughs) yeah because when we do that and we step outside of that comfort zone and we do something that we're afraid of we realize usually it wasn't that big of a deal right like what you said like oh the world kept going and turning and I didn't die and like I still have some friends and my family still loves me (laughs) we perceive things especially when we're in our fear-based mindset as bigger and more intense and scarier than they actually are usually. And for me, traveling showed me that a lot. And I remember um, after my first long trip, it was uh, I was in Australia for a year and a half. And when I came back, I had one of my skaters, I think she was 14 at the time. She was like, but what do you do? Like if you get into your room and there's like a huge spider on the wall for me, like I have a phobia of the spider, like I, I wouldn't be able to do it. And I was like, well, you just do it scared because you don't have a choice like you find it in you to deal with that spider because there's nobody else around to help you in that moment and you don't really have a choice because you don't want to be sleeping with that spider so you just find it in you and then you realize oh first that wasn't that big of a deal second I'm still alive and third look at that I'm not that afraid of spiders because I was resourceful to find it in me to have the courage to get rid of that spider And then comes the question, well, if I was able to do that, what else can I do? What else am I afraid of? And I'm holding myself back. And that's the beauty of expansion and growing and pushing through these barriers and these limiting beliefs that we have. So it's simple, but it is profound in that way because you just got to do it once and realize, oh, it's maybe not that big of a deal, you know? Yeah. And you keep doing it and and slowly but surely, like, like you prove to yourself that like you can do hard things and you yes. can handle it. And like you said, the world isn't going to fall apart mm-hmm. because that's definitely a huge fear behind perfectionism. Yep. And you just continue to show up and exercise that, that muscle and it <laughs> actually works. It actually does. Yeah. Were you ever stuck in paralysis by analysis, meaning that not stepping into action to jump on a podcast, create a post, uh, write an article, uh, sing in front of somebody or, you know, like, because you were making sure that it had to be a hundred percent perfect. And that led you to not being into action or stay in paralysis by analysis until you reach that perfection, which didn't happen. I never reached because I couldn't get there. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. For so much of my life, I just didn't do things. I wanted to. I very, very much wanted to, but knew ahead of time that it wasn't going to be perfect because, well, obviously. And that stopped me. I let it stop me from doing so many things. Do you have examples and, of things that you didn't do or you wished you had done? <laughs> my whole life. No, um, <laughs> probably one of the biggest ones was, you know, after, you know, high school and you're picking university and what major do you want to go to? And I was singing a lot and I was genuinely thinking about applying for music. Like I love doing it. It just, I loved singing mm-hmm. and I didn't because I'm like, there's no way I can be perfect. But if I go into the safety of the math and sciences, there's like a a route, there's a method, there's a way you can do it to the letter. I'm going to go that way because it's safer. And I don't say like, I don't regret making that decision. Like I, I, I am here today and that was the path that I chose to get there. Yeah. Um, definitely. And, and I remember when Sarah 
and I were talking and and she was like talking about me coming on the podcast and being like a co-host for that. I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> um, you know, I spend all of my days behind my computer screen and I hem and haw over words for hours trying to get them perfect. And you mm-hmm. mean to tell me that we're just going to record this or like do something live and I can't edit myself afterwards, <laughs> I'm going to say, like, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I don't pick the precise adjective that I want to use? What if I stumble over my words? Like, can I would want, I wanted to throw, I didn't even want to do it. Mm. Um, but by that point I was like, okay, I'm going to show up scared and I'm going to, it's going to be really, really uncomfortable. And for, for so many episodes, I was like, oh, I hate this so much. <laughs> Just the level of discomfort in me. And I'm like, oh, did I really say that? Oh, it sounds so bad. And and being up at night genuinely afraid that people were going to hate me. Mm, yeah. Because be, like I couldn't actually pinpoint why. It's just because it was less than perfect. Yeah. And that was pretty recent. Right. Yes. So it goes to show that it, it's a journey and you've come such a long way. And then you get to a point where you're faced with oh, a new challenge, a new opportunity, a new situation, a new relationship. And you're like, oh, OK, deeper layer now that I got to look at and heal and accept and step into, you know, courage and action, even if I'm fearful again. So, I mean, you asked me to come on this podcast and I didn't even think twice about it. I was just like, yes, I want to talk to you and yeah, people can listen to it. For sure. And we just chat and I stumble on words as well. And, you know, I do a lot of Franklish and, but it just shows that like, oh, we're humans. Interesting. <laughs> Heaven <Weird>. forbid. <laughs> <sighs> so anything else that uh, you did to help you? Was it like maybe coaching, therapy, journaling, reading some books, like any other modalities that you did or that you could suggest for anybody listening out there who's like, oh yeah, I'm still really stuck in that perfectionist mindset. Definitely. I mean, I've been in therapy for a very, very long time. And I think just having that space that's designated towards understanding you and growing is so important. Having conversations with really amazing friends, also really helpful. I've done you know I've worked with our mutual friend Joe doing like timeline therapy releasing Mm -hmm. emotions beliefs and wounds that's been hugely helpful and recent as well and I think that's kind of expedited all of the growth that you see and a lot of it was self-reflection seeing that I would never in a million years say the things that I say to myself to someone else. I would never set the standards that I set for myself for someone else. Why is it I'm like exempt from my own compassion? Mm. And so that bit was really big for me because I'm like, oh. Did you find an answer to that question? I'm uh, pretty sure it's ego because ego likes to be the I'm different from everyone else. And it I'm can so either special. be in a, <laughs> yeah, it can either be in like a boastful way, like I am better than everyone else, but ego works in the opposite direction. It could be I'm worse than everyone else. And mm-hmm. I just happen to choose that direction. Right. Um, like, why is it me that is like the worst person in the world and everyone else is fine and mm. I am so lenient with everyone else and I have so much compassion and understanding, but that stops when it comes to me. That was that was a pretty profound realization. Do you find that you have more compassion for yourself recently and nowadays? Yeah, I mean, work in progress as all things. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely a really key component to helping me get out and do those hard things. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that tool, which is, you know, imagine you're talking to your best friend or if you, if you're a parent, a child, or, you know, how would you treat like your cat? Would you get mad at them because they weren't perfect? Like, no, you you love them because they aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of doing that reframe. And I still have to catch myself. I still That's fall the back. work. 
That's the yeah. word. You're aware, you're in the observer seat, you catch yourself and you bring yourself back and use those tools and those affirmation sentences, modalities. And yeah, it's always catching ourselves. <laughs> well, yeah, even the conversations I have with you, you're always talking about being that observer, yeah. having that like eagle eye view. And I'm like, oh yeah, crap, I forgot about that. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for the reminder, Claudia. Yeah, it's my favorite place to be in because it allows you to step back and still experience your life through your senses and still go through all the emotions as humans and still catch yourself in those patterns. But with less of that one pressure to be perfect, less of that self-judgment, like, oh shit, you know, I did this again, or I got sucked into like a negative downward spiral again. And because you're back from it, you observe yourself. Like you said, it's a it's a bigger, broader view. We're so like in our own shit sometimes. So to kind of step back and look and look at like the perspective of everything, it's like, oh, it's just more of a neutral seat, I find, than like being in it all the time. So I like to be in my observer seat a lot. It's yeah. almost like being aware that you're aware. It, it's exactly that. Yeah. And if you've been sitting in the seat of perfectionism and it hasn't worked thus far, I invite you to try a different seat. Try a different seat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I work with a lot of women. There's a lot of women who listen to the podcast and even for men or anybody, um, body image and having that perfect body is something that I know you struggle with. I struggle with a lot of, like I said, humans on this beautiful planet struggle with that because of that standard, what we see on social media, the magazines and the beauty, you know, standards and what we quote unquote should look like. How do you feel that that perfectionist label influenced that desire to have that quote unquote perfect body? And because you talked about school, obviously, right? That was a big area for you to to be perfect in school. How was it with, like I said, body image and that connection between, oh, if I have a perfect body and I look quote unquote perfect, then insert belief or pattern or subconscious programming. Yeah, no, no one can call me ugly or lazy or undisciplined or have these thoughts about me. Um mm -hmm. Oh, goodness, that mindset drove me to some very dark, very unhealthy places when I was, you know, a teenager. And I'm not there anymore, thank goodness, mm -hmm. but I still struggle with it. It's yeah. really hard. And I have my days where I'm like, oh, why, why do I not have a six pack, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why why do I weigh this much? Why why am I holding water? Why why am I human? Yeah. <laughs> right? And the one thing that helps me is reminding myself of what my priorities are. Right? My priority cannot be I need to have a perfect body because in order to get there I'm probably going to do things that don't align with my values you know, I'm going to have to sacrifice everything else for it. I'm not going to prioritize my health. So making health the priority over how I look has mm -hmm. been really important yeah. for this journey. And and as I said, it's ongoing. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that, that difference is so key because again, consciously or consciously, we look at a quote unquote perfect body and we're like, oh, this person must be healthy. Like we sometimes associate the two, but like, that's not always the case. It, it is true that how we look can inform, you know, our health, but mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're not uh, one and the same. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you have any sort of things that you tell yourself yeah. um, to get through it. Yeah. It's a, it's a journey for sure. And I think naming it is important because in my early twenties, like nobody knew I was going through these dark days and like bad time, energy, mental space consuming uh, eating disorders. So even you and I, I think it was last week. We're like, yeah, I'm having a fat day. And like, yeah, I woke up and I felt like I was 10 pounds heavier. And like, yeah, like I went to the gym and I had to change my clothes because I didn't feel comfortable in my skin. So yeah. voicing it and naming it kind of like 
again, puts you a little further back into that observer seat and you're not staying stuck with these thoughts and these perceptions of yourself because you did not gain 10 or 20 pounds overnight, right? (laughs) Are you sure? Are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) And sharing that with people you trust is just, it just becomes like, yeah, I see you. I feel you. It happens to me too. And you don't feel as alone. I felt very alone when I had my peak of eating disorder. So nowadays, almost, almost 10 years later, like this is really helpful for me. Um, going back to that observer seat and almost coaching myself, like it is impossible, Claudia, that you gain 10 pounds overweight overnight. So, okay. I can, I can laugh about it. I might feel this way, but the fact is impossible. It helps me gain perspective and Mm -hmm. I just rely on like how I feel like, for example, I'll go to the gym. Like I'm still really strong, even though I feel a more bloated today, or I feel like I have a quote unquote fat day. Right. So that helps me as well. So it's just the coaching and I don't get consumed by these thoughts anymore. So they'll, they will appear in my head, but I'm not going to give them too much attention. Um, Brad yeah. says that like not every thought and every feeling deserves their attention. Right. So it's like, oh, I'm thinking today that I look fat. I don't need to give attention to that thought because it's it's not reality and it's it's perception. And travel again, traveling so much and seeing the beauty standards in different countries. I'm like, okay, like perfect bodies, but says who? Perfect to be yeah. on Instagram in the States or perfect to be like in Peru where you have to be overweight to have the quote unquote perfect body. And like Somewhere it's the curly hair, somewhere it's really, really pale skin, somewhere else it's like all about the glutes, and then somewhere else it's all about the boobs. So just that, pers- again, that eagle eye view of like, okay, like my perfect body that I for years tried to achieve, perfect for who? <laughs> Somebody who's like muscular or like super shredded and has a six pack, there's probably a lot of men who don't like that look. So again, just coaching myself and bringing myself back to these reflections and these yeah just thinking about the whole thing this way is really helpful but I don't even have to go there anymore like it's just been so many years that I've done so much you know growth and healing journey and focusing on health you know and not just how I look and training differently and for different goals and just sharing my story and realizing like oh the world did not end because people found out I had eating disorders and sometimes I feel fat in my around my stomach you know or whatever that is, whatever we critique about our bodies. So mm-hmm. anyway, that was a big blob, but some stuff that I tell myself or that I think about when this happens, but I've for sure come a long way, obviously, uh, haven't binged in since May 2, 2015. So that's like eight years ago. Mm-hmm. I still have my moments though. I'll go get, but that too, like I'll allow myself to not be quote unquote perfect with my nutrition. That was the biggest the biggest thing that changed uh, after that binge on May 2nd, I just had like a month of traveling with my sister and I just got back into balance. Like, oh, I'm allowed to have a muffin. I don't have to eat 12 of them because I'm not being perfect. So I'll just binge and make sure that I go back to being perfect the next day. So finding that balance again, that 80-20 rule or 90-10 rule that I coach my clients, like, yeah, you can have different foods. That just help my body go back to like what it's quote unquote supposed to look like when I don't focus so much on what I look like and focus on my health and my sleep and my energy. And so, man, it's a journey. We could do a whole five hour podcast podcast on this topic on on food and eating. But I think you brought up a really good point that like when you are caught in perfectionism, you do get stuck in that all or nothing thinking for sure. Which is like, Hey, if I can't be perfect, then I'm just going to throw it all of the window and do whatever. And also bringing in that, like, not every thought needs your attention. Like when you are a perfectionist, you inherently have a very unreliable narrator inside of your head telling you things. And it can be so helpful to get out of your head, talk to other people and put your awareness into something other than the thoughts you might be having Mm -hmm. in one area or another. For sure. Yeah. Cause our thoughts influence our emotions and vice versa. So, you know, change your state, shake your snow globe, you know, find the joy, do something that makes you feel better in the moment. And you'll see that you won't get consumed by these 
these thoughts or that narr- narrative, you know, and that inner dialogue was not always helpful and aligned with our highest good. So mm-hmm. yeah, balance and perfection, allowing ourselves to be imperfect, whether that's eating popcorn once a week, because I freaking love popcorn and like, that's okay, you know, and skipping a workout or, you know, posting a pose that's not quote unquote perfect or posting this podcast that's not quote unquote perfect. So I think that's a good uh, way to kind of wrap this conversation. Just reminding that you just step into imperfect action and magic can come out of it. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Anything else before I ask my final question, anything else you want to share that's close to your heart or that you want to leave her listeners with? No, I think I've said it all. (laughs) Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, super grateful for you. I'm really uh, honored that you shared a part of your story today. And uh, thank you for your friendship, for allowing me to be imperfect and for being that sounding board and for us to share stories and chat. And I can't wait to see you in person again, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. And thank you for Mm -hmm. letting me come on and for also letting me be imperfect and still wanting to hang out with me afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. So my final question is what your favorite quotes and why? Lover of words there. My favorite quote. (laughs) There are so many. Same, which is why I asked this question to all of my guests. (laughs) Okay. I have one that is maybe a little unrelated to this. That's okay. Doesn't have um, to be. But I repeat it to myself often. And it's forgiveness is the illusion that ends all illusions. Mm. Say that again. Forgiveness is the illusion that ends all illusions. How is this quote helping you? That we can often get in our head. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you, you don't say. Um, weaving stories and making meaning and most of the time as you say we can make mountains out of molehills like so the mountain was a complete illusion and Mm. we've just been going around in circles but if we can forgive what is and I guess you could also say accept there aren't any illusions after that we just see it as it is in the same way that you're like, hey, be in your observer seat. Mm-hmm. Don't create any stories around this. Just yeah. see it as it is. So if you are caught in your head and you are <laughs> dancing with perfectionism, forgiveness. I've never heard that quote. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome.